Uh, hello. I am Dan Snow. I'm a senior data scientist with the Cook County Assessor's Office. Um, for those of you not familiar with our office, we are responsible for determining the property values in Cook County, which ultimately lead to property tax bills. So if you are a property owner, you're probably familiar with us already. Uh, if not, this will be a sort of crash course in um, our tech stack, what we're doing and what we've improved since last year. This is V3 of this model. Actually, I'm gonna go back. Uh, V2 I presented last year, and this is gonna be sort of in the format of a change log. You know, the major improvements that we've made since V2. As I mentioned, the assessor's office, our job is to mirror the market. Uh, what does that actually mean? It means that we are trying to determine the value of unsold property by looking at the sales, the real sales of similar properties. Uh, and we do that with a huge statistical model that ultimately estimates a single value for each property in the entire county. Uh, this process happens in parts. So Cook County is split up into three parts called triads. Uh, the city is one, right, that's here. Uh, that was reassessed last year in 2021. Uh, this year, the North Triad up here will be reassessed, and that includes all of the townships that are on the left there. So if you're from the northern suburbs, you will be reassessed this year in 2022. Uh, next year will be the south and west suburbs in 2023. Uh, if you are a property owner, maybe even if you're not, you may have noticed that the real estate market has been kind of wild lately. It's been since basically the start of COVID going up like 10 to 15% year over year for single family. Uh, and that makes our job very difficult. Uh, this is just basically year over year median, median price. And you can see that since 2017, median value has jumped 18% for only the North suburbs. Uh, this is the same, same price change, but just mapped out. And you can see pretty much everything is green, meaning that almost the entire part of the north, uh, northern part of Cook has grown in value. So our job is to reflect that, right? We know that the market is growing. Assessments have to grow as well. And as I said, we do that with the model. I'm gonna talk a lot about the model today, but what do I actually mean when I say the model? Uh, there's actually two models. There is a residential model for single and multifamily property, which has individual characteristics like number of bedrooms or the square footage. And there is a condo model, which is different, works in sort of a different way, um, but also is a giant statistical model. Um, both of these models are basically just applied predictive machine learning models. So if you're at all familiar with the space, we're training the model with sales that we see to predict the value of unsold property. Uh, a lot of the county is valued with these two models, not all of it. Commercial property and some other special properties have a different approach that does not involve this model in any way. So before I get to this year's model, let me talk about the past. Past performance in the northern suburbs of Cook was actually pretty good. Um, so assessors in general are concerned with very assessor specific stats, but they're the sort of baseline things that you'd still look at if you were doing general ML, error ratio, sort of um, variance, things like that. They've just been retermed into assessor specific things. So the main things that we're concerned with are accuracy, mainly the ratio, the ratio being the estimated value divided by the actual sale price of a property. And you want that ratio to be as close to one as possible. If the median ratio is close to one, that means your assessment is pretty accurate to the sale price. The other thing is COD, which is kind of like a measure of variance, basically measuring the spread of values on very similar properties or very similar values. 
Uh, and then horizontal and vertical, or vertical equity rather, measuring sort of the, the distribution or the difference in valuation between high and low value properties. Uh, assessors are mainly concerned with COD, and there is a sort of target range that they all aim to be in, which is set by a standards body that's between five and 15. This is all the performance from 2019, and you can see that generally in the North Tri, we did very well. So green means we met the stat, Yellow means we didn't, and we have this one here, which is very close, but otherwise met everything. CODs are quite low. Uh, that said, there are still challenges, right? So the biggest challenge for us, especially in the North, is sort of conditional averaging. Basically, any sort of machine learning model is gonna work based on some sort of conditional averaging, ours included. And that means that what tends to happen is you undervalue high value property and overvalue low value property just based on the average, right? That is true of our model. It's true of models nationwide. It's true of most predictive models and we're always fighting that tendency. So here, this is from past assessments. You can see uh, this is the curve of the ratios so as property gets more valuable, the ratio, the sale ratio that I mentioned before, which is the estimated value divided by the sale price, gets lower. So a $1 million home might be assessed at $800,000 if the sale ratio was 0.8. Uh, this problem everywhere throughout the entire US. You may have seen these plots in the New York Times um, they're from a professor at University of Chicago who basically measured the, the regressivity, that curve and the ratio from every municipality in the entire US and it's just endemic everywhere. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for this that I'm happy to go into, but uh, suffice to say, it's not our problem alone, but we, always, we are always fighting it and I'll talk more about what specifically we're doing in a little. But before I talk about how we're doing it, I wanna talk about what we did. So here are our results. This is 2019, that same, uh, that same little spreadsheet on the left with 2022 on the right. And 2020, or 2019 is actually post uh, manual correction by teams of analysts. So we're being a little bit less than generous to ourselves compared to these values, which have no corrections. They're straight out of the model. But the main takeaway here is that COD, that important stat, has improved across the board compared to 2019. What that means in turn is that our model has gotten significantly more accurate since 19, and we're still meeting most of the stats. Uh, the ratios are slightly lower, basically because the prices are going up so fast that if you <laughs> divide the estimated value by the sale price, it's always gonna be lower. It's like a mechanical effect. And PRD and PRB also almost all meeting. So overall performance has improved a lot. And as I said, we're always fighting that averaging. We're trying to flatten those curves, those ratio curves. And for the most part this year, we have done that. Right. These curves are very flat almost across the board for every township in the North Tri. Uh, as I mentioned, the models are split into condo and res. Both models perform very well. Right? They basically meet all the standards. And green is good. Right? Yellow would mean we weren't meeting it, but we're meeting basically every, every standard including for vertical equity, it's that I mentioned before. If you're in the ML space, you might be more familiar with RMSE, root mean squared error. It's hard to interpret here unless you know the prices of all the property. So like this one is very high because there's a lot of million plus dollar homes in that area. So of course the RMSE is higher as well. And then geographically, results are 
pretty good across the board, right? We're meeting COD almost everywhere and those vertical equity stats almost everywhere as well. And most exciting part, this is percent increases by neighborhood uh, throughout the North Tri. So darker, the larger the increase from 2021, this is the percent increase in the estimated value, right? And again, these are the modeled values. They may not reflect the actual values mailed to taxpayers. They're just sort of preliminary. Um, but you can see lots of increases in the North Shore, increases around O'Hare. A lot of the increases around O'Hare are like a mechanical effect. The property values there are low to begin with. And so even a marginal absolute increase has a really large percentage increase. Um, so that's what we did. Those are our results, right? We've improved a lot, and now I wanna talk about what we did to get there. So, as I said, gonna present a sort of change log, and it'll be imperative titles and with a focus on three major areas that we worked on, including process, infrastructure, uh, data, and then modeling itself. So starting with process stuff, our biggest change was moving to AWS. Uh, if you ever looked at the assessor's old modeling code, you probably saw a lot of hard-coded Windows paths to like weird shared drives and stuff. All that is gone, right? We moved everything to S3. Uh, the, the data layer is just entirely S3. All the objects are stored there. The query layer used to be an old sort of in-house SQL server now it's just Athena, just querying files on the cloud. Uh, and we collapsed many, many formats that we had into just a few. And you might ask, Dan, why does that matter at all? Why do I care about this? Uh, it's because just having this infrastructure upgrade has let us improve so much with the model. Being able to have all our data organized and in one place has let us add like 50 new actual features to the valuation model itself. Uh, and importantly, uh, having it on AWS lets other external services interface with the data, which is not possible when it was just on an internal you know, shared drive. Uh, and I'll talk more about what the services are in a minute. Also, uh, before, whenever we were modeling, one issue was that we had many, many versions of the training data that we would use to train the model. And if I wanted to replicate results, I might have to go to my coworker and be like, hey, please give me data version you know, 53 or something like that. That is not productive when you're dealing with dozens and dozens of data sets. So we fixed that problem by transitioning to DVC DVC is kind of like um, Git, but for data. You basically can version any input or output data set, and then it just goes to the cloud, and then if you need to get that data set, uh, you type DVC pull, and it just retrieves it automatically. This is super useful, because it just completely simplifies all the collaboration if we're working on one model altogether. It also acts as a sort of permanent record of the data that we used to train the final model. So before, the data set that we used for final training in 2019, it's probably on the shared drive. But now, we have an immutable record that is just stored on S3 forever. So if we ever need to go back and replicate the model from 22, it will be there. Uh, we've also started to track every single model that we run. So before, uh, we basically only cared about the final version, right? the version that we picked, and it was hard to compare the different iterations. Now we track every single run, all of it. All the outputs, all the model objects, everything goes into S3, and it will stay there in perpetuity. So each model gets a funny name, which is the date that it was run, uh, a friendly adjective, and then a random employee's name, Including, uh, including Kira, who's in the back. Uh, let's see, Nicole also in the back. 
And yeah, they just, they have great names. I love it. We stole this naming convention from Docker. Don't tell anybody. Um, but this has been super productive just because it has vastly improved accountability, right? We have all the models saved. We know where they are. We know what their names are. Um, it's also facilitated just way cleaner experimentation. If we're trying to iterate on a model, we don't have to say, oh, did you get this model from this date? We say, oh, did you get Keen Gabe? How is Keen Gabe performing? <laughs> and it's wonderful. I love it. Uh, this is a little more in the weeds, but we've also vastly simplified the actual code. So before, it was sort of all custom R code, base R, et cetera. We've basically transitioned everything now to tidy models, which is the new sort of uh, R standard framework for doing ML. Each stage in this pipeline is just one R script. Right? So it's relatively simple and understandable. There's a lot going on in each script, but it's heavily commented. It's meant to be public facing. Anyone can check out this code and run it. Right? You don't need DVC. You don't need access to our S3. The data is in the repository. You could go and run this right now if you wanted. So the result of all this is just a far more usable pipeline for both ourselves and for the public who may be interested in replicating or even improving our results. This is a big one. So before, uh, I was writing all the viz and reporting for the modeling in R Markdown or in Excel or some sort of similar tech. It takes a lot of time. If someone wants a change in the graph, they have to be like, hey, Dan, can you change this axis of the graph? And that takes time away from me that could be spent on improving the model. So we ended up moving all of our reporting to Tableau. It's just much faster to iterate. The visualizations are ultimately better, and it's interactive. I think it's been a huge win for us, big improvement, um, and just given us more time to work on modeling itself. Most of the screenshots that you saw earlier, by the way, are just directly from Tableau. All right, so that's the process stuff. I'll talk about the data. We added a lot of characteristics to the model, many things. Um, we went from 40-something in 21 to around 100 in 22. And a lot of those are sort of third-party data sources, um, things like data from the census, the ACS, um, economic data from a whole ton of sources, and then things that we calculated ourselves as well. So distance to different amenities, like CTA stops, anything that can impact value that we can get in a relatively easy way. Uh, you'll note that there's not really any major characteristic changes. It's because it's just very, very difficult to gather characteristics at scale. There are 1.8 million properties in the county. If we wanted to include any characteristic updates in the model, we would need to update basically all of them. So it is quite a lift, but we'll talk more about that later. All right, in addition to new features, we also added or sorry, we also improved some existing ones. So in the past, we had a feature for airport noise with the assumption that living next to an airport is detrimental to value because it's very noisy. And the way that used to work was if you're inside the red buffer around O'Hare, you hear noise. And if you're outside of it, you don't hear noise. <laughs> and that's not really how noise works. <laughs> Uh, we also just didn't have one for Midway, which doesn't make sense either. Um, so we fixed both of those problems. Uh, we actually had an intern take on this project to do a sort of noise surface, a continuous surface that would predict the noise level at individual locations using um, data from noise monitors that are placed around O'Hare. So super successful update, I think. Much more sensible and intuitive than than that thing. Condo features. So as I mentioned, the condo model is quite different from the res model. Uh, you may be surprised to learn that if you own a condo, we know absolutely nothing about your unit. We do not know the square footage. We do not know how many bedrooms it has. Basically nothing. And that is because the assessor is not allowed to enter buildings, right? We can't go in and inspect 
your condo unit. But obviously that poses a challenge for modeling because we just don't have very many characteristics to model on. That has somewhat changed this year. We have added building and unit square footage to the majority of properties in the North Dry, which is a big improvement. Um, there's also some other stuff in here that I'm not gonna go into, a little technical. The takeaway from this is just that the condo model is more accurate than it has ever been. All right, so that's the data stuff, and then better modeling itself. So this is sort of into the, into the real weeds, as if we weren't there already. All right, so I mentioned that we have transitioned to tidy models. That's the ML framework that we're using. We also use LightGBM, which is um, an ML package or a framework um, for doing gradient boosting decision, gradient boosted decision trees. We used it in 21. We're using it again this year. It performs very, very well on our data and it's very fast to train. The problem is that LightGBM and tidy models do not play well together. So we wrote an R package to act as a shim between them to get sort of better integration between the two. Why does that matter? Because it has decreased our training time very significantly. Um, by unlocking some of the advanced features of LightGBM, we've cut the training time by like two thirds and increased model accuracy. Okay, now we're really in the weeds. All right, so we also switched to a better cross-validation method. When we're doing assessments, we are trying to estimate value in the future. Right? We're training the model on past sales to predict the assessed value at January 1st in the year ahead. So we have to make sure that whatever model we train is good at doing that. And one way to do that is to have sort of a test train model split that holds out the most recent sales so that you know that you have the best performance on that set. If you want to improve that further, you can use what's called rolling origin cross-validation. And basically that just is a way to ensure that you're training the model and selecting parameters in such a way as to always get the best predictions into the future. And then ultimately, when we do the final assessments, we train on all the data right up until the date before assessment. So December 31st of 2021 in this case. All right, in addition to CV, we've also made some other sort of more minor improvements. Um, for instance, if you have an ADU, those have uh, traditionally been valued in a very weird way. Now we have a slightly better method to do that. If you have a townhome and you're in a complex full of identical units, you should get a consistent valuation with your neighbor. Uh, and then we also just had a bunch more flags for weird anomalous properties that we can go in and sort of hand review. Result of all of this, all the methodological, methodological improvements are a far more accurate model with fewer like very, very wonky values. This one, very exciting to me. So one issue with using a tree-based model like LightGBM is that it is difficult to interpret, right? Unlike a linear model where you can say each additional square foot adds X dollars in value, that does not apply when you have a complex nonlinear model. The solution to that, or at least one solution, is to use what are called shop values, which are basically the per feature contribution to the estimated value per observation. So each observation gets a set of shop values based on its feature. And I'll show you an example to make this a little clearer. The payoff for this is just that it makes the model much easier to interpret. It tells us that it's doing what it should and not giving completely wonky values based on some sort of spurious feature that we added. Uh, and to give you a proper example, this is a friend's house. I didn't want to pick on anyone, so I, I chose him, but this is a friend's house in Logan Square. Uh, it's about a block from the Logan Square Blue Line stop. It's multifamily, so three units, actually two. Uh, relatively large square feet built 1890s. 
Prior to the 2021 reassessment, it was valued around 400K. It was bought in 2020 for 650K. And then the 2021 value that we gave it was around 800K. And of course, my friend was very mad when he got that value. I'm so sorry. Uh, and at the time, we were not able to answer the question of why. You know, why exactly did the model give me this value? But with shop values, we can, or we can at least get closer to an explanation, All right? So this is how they work. You have a baseline prediction. That is the average of the predict predictions for all properties. In this case, it's $300,000 for this contrived example. Uh, and then each observation gets a set of feature contributions. So this is just for that pin that I just showed you just for this one property. This is the contribution to the total final predicted value of each feature in this model. So year built, it's kind of an older property. It subtracts oop, around $8,000. 3,000 square feet, relatively large, adds quite a lot of value. High population of graduate degree holders in Logan Square adds a little bit more value et cetera, et cetera, down the line. If you take the sum of this whole column, you get $500,000 added to the base average prediction, which is 800,000, which is the ultimate prediction for that property. We haven't really utilized these yet. We're still thinking about how best to utilize them, but they are very useful diagnostically to know, as I said, that the model is doing what we expect. Uh, we hope to show more of this in the future. Another very exciting thing for me, before uh, the model was sort of one and done. You ran it, you got the estimations, it was not run again. If you needed new values from the model, you would have to rerun the whole thing. Now we have an API, it's just a REST API living on a server, uh, and anyone can query it, and I do mean anyone, because I integrated it with Excel. So every property has one row and every feature in the model has one column. And if you change any feature, it automatically outputs the new predicted value for that property. This is super useful because often our analysts will encounter characteristic errors where you know, maybe the square footage is wrong or they just need to value a new property that the model hasn't seen before, right? This way, I can just hand them an Excel sheet, they can change whatever characteristics they need, and it just automatically spits out whatever the new predicted value is. It is wonderful and a huge improvement. So that is what we have worked on this past year. This is what we are working on for this coming year. Two things data integrity and sales validation. Those are our major focuses for 2023. First, data integrity, right? The main problem here is that a lot of the characteristics that we have in our database are just wrong or outdated, right? It's very, very difficult to keep property characteristics up to date across millions of properties that are constantly changing. So we need a way to fix that, working on it, the other big problem is just that we don't have all the characteristics you would need to very accurately predict value. So a good example is condition. We do not know anything about a property's condition. We do not see the difference between a boarded up property and one that is newly renoed. Right? That is not tracked in our data, and it's very difficult to track across millions of properties countywide. The potential solution is basically first bulk updating the characteristics that we have. So by purchasing bulk data from vendors and other sources, we can sort of use it to update all our characteristics at once. Then create processes to keep that data up to date. And then finally add new characteristics once we have those processes in place. And so that's the, the sort of ongoing project vis-a-vis -vis data integrity. We're on step one. Step two will be in the near future. Sales validation is the other big challenge. The sales are used to train the model. 
So if they are not accurate or if they don't reflect the market, then you have the standard machine learning, learning saying of garbage in, garbage out. Um, we've done a little bit of sales validation in the past using just simple heuristics, um, but we know that there are you know, lots of potentially non-arm's length sales in our data. Non-arm's length just means um, it's not transacted on the open market, right? It wouldn't sell for that amount between sort of unrelated parties under normal conditions. So we are working to clean up and validate all the sales that go into the model with external partner at Mansueto, UChicago, basically developing a whole bunch of statistical methods and heuristics and even some ML methods to flag outlier sales and then kick them out of the training data. All right, so that's what we're working on. Some final things. If you are a regular browser of the Cook County Open Data Portal, which I hope all of you are, uh, we made a large update to all the assessors' open data sets. Uh, some highlights include the entire universe of parcels along with much attached data from 1999 until present, property sales from 1999, uh, historical assessed values, including pre-appeal values, and some other data sets as well. And those are all on the portal. You can use them for free, and we plan to continue to update them. We're updated monthly. We'll add new data in the future automatically. Ah, if you're interested in seeing any of this code, or even contributing, perhaps, uh, making an issue, we welcome issues and pull requests. Please visit our GitLab, it's all there. If you're interested in the model itself, there is a much more extensive readme there that you can go and check out. Uh, and then, as I said, the data is available on the Cook County portal. And we're also hiring. I think I said that last year and it never happened, but I promise it's gonna happen now. So uh, keep an eye on this, right, on this URL. We're gonna hire for junior level data positions. Please do not talk to us about them though. It is against the rules. <laughs> All right, final thing. Final thing I'm very excited about. Uh, if you are a longtime follower of the assessor's office, <laughs> then <laughs> you may have seen a while back uh, that we released a tool called PTAX Sim which it's in its original incantation was basically an Excel sheet. And the goal of this tool was to let property owners try to estimate their tax bill under certain conditions. So if my assessed value changed, went up by 10%, what would my new tax bill be? That is a very hard question to answer in Cook County because of a lot of reasons, but the assessment is not the only thing that determines your tax bill. So there's lots of moving pieces. This tool tried to answer that question. Uh, now we have updated it. We've made it into an R package with an attached SQLite database. And instead of calculating one bill, it can calculate all the bills. Every bill for Cook County for the last 15 years, it can calculate and it can do it in under 10 minutes for every single line item. So all tax districts, the amount that you owe to the city, to Cook County, to your school, everything. The result here is like 350, 400 million rows of just tax data that you can play around with. It is awesome and it's very fast. Now, this is super deep in the weeds and you might ask, Dan, why should I care about this at all? So the so what is, if you're an individual property owner, this will let you get the history of your property's tax bills, right? So for this random pin from the north side, you can see this is the total tax bill amount. You can see the proportion as it has changed over time. And for this pin, it's in the RPM TIF, which is the red purple modernization TIF. You can see that an increasing portion of this bill's bill, uh, this pin's bill has gone to that TIF. Uh, 
And this is just one pin. You can also do counterfactuals. So if you wanted to know what your bill would be if your assessment was 10% higher, you could calculate that. But we can also do many pins, right? So if you are a skilled developer and also a property tax nerd, you can use this tool to answer sort of very advanced counterfactual questions. Um, so in this case, uh, one example is this is the village of Wheeling, right? Red, red dots are residential properties and blue are commercial. And Wheeling has a TIF. And I'm not gonna go into what TIFs are, but suffice to say they slightly raise taxes if under certain conditions. Um, the TIF is shown in purple. It covers downtown and is mostly commercial property. PTAX sim can answer the question, what if that TIF went away? <laughs> so here is the median tax bill for all of Wheeling, all properties in Wheeling since 2016 or 2006. The TIF was created in 2014 and the purple line shows the median bill without the TIF. It's not a huge difference, about $40, right, if the TIF went away. That's at the median and that's one TIF. Right. All of this is just to show an example of the power of the tool. Right. It could be very powerful if you were a policymaker, you're trying to plan sort of counterfactuals, determine what would happen under different scenarios, et cetera. So we're really excited about it. It's not public yet. Uh, we hope to make it public shortly. At the moment, it is very, very developer focused. Right. As I said, it is an R package. We hope to make it much more accessible in the future with uh, you know, a GUI or something like that. All right, so that's what we've done. Thank you all, uh, and I will take <laughs> questions. Hi, so two related questions. First, why, like you showed the graph from the Times of like why, eat, like all the graphs of uh, the different, like the assessed value versus the actual like sale price, kind of like why are the curves different in different places? And then second, like could you just fix that by basically just running something against the model and like reversing the curve? Like just saying like, if it's expensive, multiply by 1.1. If it's cheap, multiply by 0.9. I'm guessing the value is no. I'm curious why. You're talking about these curves? Yeah. <laughs> They're different just because different assessors use different models and have different classes of properties, right? So it's different situations. This is across the whole US, right? So you're never gonna have sort of um, exactly the same type or amount of regressivity in all the same areas, right? This is ultimately showing regressivity, right? The lowest value properties, this is the bottom 10%, have much higher assessed values or ratios than relative assessed values than the top 10%. It's true across the US. Why can you not just basically fit on the residuals is basically what you're asking. Uh, most, most assessor's offices, I think, uh, they could do that. I don't know, that's similar to what we've done. I don't have an answer for that because I'm not those offices, so. Um, but the reason that this problem really exists is just because um, most of the offices have bad data, just like we do. They're not using super sophisticated cutting edge machine learning models. They're mostly using linear regression, right? Um, and then they just don't have enough data, right? They don't, like us, they don't have any information about the interior characteristics of most properties. It just ends up causing a lot of error and this is how it manifests. And then, you know, why they don't correct it, I don't know, not those offices. All right, there is, a, there is a question from the internet. Oh, well. um, I know, that's always dangerous. Uh, what are some references that you suggest looking at when learning about SHAP values? Uh, the SHAP values GitHub, like the, the base Python package is excellent. It's really, really good. Uh, I highly recommend that. It's got plots of like basically everything that you can do with SHAP values. Um, the original paper is also excellent. We were very fortunate that 
Light GBM has built-in methods for calculating these feature contributions. Otherwise, I think they'd be very expensive to calculate. Um, but yeah, if you're interested, check out the GitHub of the SHAP Python package. It's great. And the OG paper that you know came up proposed uh, SHAP values. Uh, yeah, I was just curious, um, before you settled on um, the tree-based models, mm -hmm. did you experiment with any other um, techniques or um, what your experience with those models were before you settled on LightGBM? Yeah, great question. Um, we did. We tried a bunch of stuff, many, many things. Um, we tried neural nets. SVM doesn't really work for our data. Uh, all sorts of just sort of standard regressions, GBM. I could go down the list. We basically tried everything aside from very deep neural networks. And tree-based models tend to work the best for our data just because it, they have much better handling of categoricals, which property data has a lot of. Um, the built-in methods are great, and you don't have to do wild transformations to uh, fit the data. There's no assumptions about the sort of form of the data, right? It doesn't have to be normal, all sorts of stuff like that. They're just the easiest model that train the, quick, the quickest and perform the best for our data. We've tried basically everything else aside from very complicated neural nets. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, you mentioned that you were going to buy or had bought like vendor data that had additional like housing characteristics. I'm mm -hmm. wondering who those vendors are, what that looks like. Uh, TBD. I don't know if I'm allowed, allowed to announce that yet, so I'm not going to say. But, you know, there, we've expressed interest in getting um, UAD data from like appraisals. I think there's been a little bit of traction on that. Um, but TBD. Talk to me after. Uh, how do you account for the fact that um, you don't know the conditions of the properties when you're assessing them? Yeah, it's tough. Um, I have long believed that condition is one of the major sources of error in our model. Uh, it's difficult to know that for sure because, again, we, we don't have the data. How do we account for it? by doing the best that we can in all the other facets of the model and then hoping that you know some of the features are correlated with condition which they often are um, especially the spatial stuff right often that correlates with condition at the individual property level is where that premise sort of falls apart because you could have a very nice property right next to a completely run down one it's something we're working on, right? We want to get that condition data. Um, it matters a lot, especially for the city, where there's much more uh, heterogeneity in the property types and conditions. In the North Tri doesn't matter as much. Um, south also not not as much, but yeah, we're working on it, we're trying to get that data, and in the meantime, doing everything we can to make sure the model is great in other ways. Yeah, uh, why are uh, property tax bills late coming out this year? <laughs> you know, that is a, an institutional thing that is sort of divorced from me. Um, I'm not, I'm honestly not really involved in that process and I don't want to, I don't want to speculate, so I'm not gonna. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I also have a potentially speculative problem or okay. question, but I'm curious, like how are there ways in which you could see this data in a more accurate model being used for a more equitable approach to the distribution of like the property tax burden? If lower priced homes are higher, obviously they need help uh, assessing and appealing that assessment. And are you able to like, do you see that these tools like, do you see a path forward for making that easier and for making it easier to find higher uh, assessed properties to pay their perhaps more equitable share, in my personal opinion? That's the goal of this whole model, right? We want to create something that is more equitable because in the, ma in the past, as I'm sure you know, some of you are familiar with, uh, assessments were not 
equitable, right? The low value properties, especially in the city, were vastly overassessed, and the high value ones were underassessed. The goal of this entire model of the past two years of work has been to fix that problem. Right? It's aiming toward equity and trying to flatten that line, right? So that people are paying their fair share. Um, what is the appeal process like if you want to appeal or challenge your valuation? And is that used to influence the model? Uh, the appeals process has no influence on the model. Uh, I'm actually not a property owner, so I cannot speak to <laughs> the appeals process. I will direct you to our wonderful uh, comms officer over here to learn more about it. Hi, I'm Scott Smith. I'm the chief communications officer with the Cook County Assessor's Office. The appeal process doesn't have an effect on the model. It happens after the model has done its work and put a value on the property. The appeals process, essentially what happens is you submit evidence such as, hey, I have an appraisal on my home. Uh, it disagrees, this opinion of value disagrees with the assessment. Uh, you might look at other homes in your area and say, hey, these folks are identical to mine. Their homes are valued much lower. So you might submit that evidence to us, an analyst looks at it and makes a decision about whether to reduce the value of your property or not. If you don't like the fact that, or if you don't like the answer you got from our office, you can go to the Cook County Board of Review and you can also appeal there. Um, as a follow-up, wouldn't that be the, the best data to train them on a little bit better? The problem with depending purely on appeals for training a model that's supposed to equitably value all 1.1 million properties is that there is a big difference between the folks who appeal and the folks who don't. You have to know that you can. You have to uh, have a half an hour or so to file an appeal. Um, unfortunately, and this is also a problem throughout the US, people who appeal tend to be higher on the income scale. Um, they tend to be, um, they had, tend to have more free time. Um, you can imagine the kind of inequity that builds in. So it's why it's really important to make sure that we're depending on a model to assess properties and not just depending on a self-selected group of people who tend to have the higher value homes to appeal. And it's why we don't purely depend just on appeals. Now, does the appealed value end up informing some things? Um, particularly in commercial properties, that tends to happen more often, but it doesn't necessarily become a characteristic that feeds into the model. Uh, a little bit more on um, property uh, condition. Um, it's, it, it seems like that's a big miss. And um, I wonder if uh, by going to place to other departments like uh, building permits, building permits, and I'm not sure, you might have to go to municipalities to get that data, uh, whether you can make a stab at, uh, at getting something like that. And also maybe the delta between previous sale and current sale, because if somebody did a whole remodel job and sold it. So we have started looking at the deltas. That's a great idea. Um, the permits data is already what we use to update the characteristics. Um, and for the most part, does not include condition. And even if it did, you would again have some selection bias in who is filing permits, what sort of permits are filed, et cetera. And so there's, there's a problem there as well. I agree with you. It's something we obviously need to work on. It's just one of the biggest data challenges that you can imagine because condition is constantly changing. Right, and we would need some way to keep it consistently updated across millions of properties. So happy to talk more about it though. I'm all ears on ideas. So does your uh, technology advancements help you to predict better based on the unknowns that you uh, already have in play? Uh, yes insofar as the things that are in the model are correlated with those unknowns. We obviously don't know the sort of unknown unknowns. There's always gonna be residual error that we just don't know anything about. But does it help us predict better? Yes, this whole tech stack has significantly improved the accuracy 
of the model, of both our models. Um, what was the process for appraising homes like before you built this model? Before we built this particular model? Or, yeah, just maybe the analog version. I don't know what, what went into it before. Oh, I don't know. I don't know in like a pre-modeling times, but I can speak to the previous model. Yeah, still some burials, so. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to say too much. You can see me after, but uh, they, they also use the model, right? And it was a linear model based on a subset of the features that are now in this one. Um, it was, they had a small model basically for each sub-location in the county. Um, and it, all, it did the same thing, outputted predicted values or estimated assessed values, but it was just much, much less accurate. Um, before that, before computer appraisal, I'm not sure, honestly, I am not an assessment historian, um, but we can, we can talk after, I can look it up. Um, so we'll do the internet one first. Um, can you share a little bit more about how sales data like MLS, et cetera, is used? and the messiness involved. Has something like MLS been useful for filling in missing data like bedrooms, bathrooms, et cetera? Uh, so we do not have access to the MLS <laughs> for <laughs> reasons. Um, the sales data that we get is from the Department of Revenue um, via their portal. And it's, it's fairly comprehensive. The issue with it is that it is very, very messy. Uh, I think I mentioned that on the slide, didn't go into detail. Basically what we get about each sale is the date that it happens, which is often truncated, the sale price, which is sometimes wrong, um, and the names of the parties that had the transaction in an unstructured text field. So it's difficult to use that data in any meaningful way to sort of detect outliers because there's just not a lot of it and it's very unstructured. Um, that has been the big challenge in sort of cleaning it up and integrating it better with the model. We're working on that right now, right? That will be done by the end of this year. We'll have a new sort of process for doing that validation that will ultimately, I think, kick out a larger proportion of the bad, bad sales. And by bad, I just mean non-market. Yeah, um, I'm curious um, if you have any insight into uh, what other um, heavily populated counties are doing um, in the country and if there's anything you'd like to eventually like emulate that other um, counties are doing. Uh, we're about to go find out. There's a cool assessors conference in Boston in a couple weeks. So we're... <laughs> Boston? Are, yeah, I've heard of that. To Boston, sorry. Um, no, that is a, a big opportunity for us. Okay, we're going to see what other people are doing. We obviously do look at what other counties are doing, how they do their assessments, New York, Maricopa in particular. Um, they do similar things for the most part, right? It's all sort of statistical modeling and Maricopa builds like many smaller models that are mostly linear instead of doing, you know, one big model. New York does weird quantile regressions and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but we're really excited to go and learn more about what they're working on. The largest sort of property market in the U.S., uh, California, does not really have the same assessment process. So it's not a lot to learn from them, unfortunately. But I hope that they will also be at IAAO so we can talk to them. Dan is uh, wisely uh, not trying to reveal stuff that's still in process. But since I'm paid to speak for the office, I'm going to go ahead and say it. And if anybody wants to get mad at me, they can get mad at me. Um, the condition stuff is the hardest nut to crack. Um, the best way for us to do it is to get as much data as possible, so not do it piecemeal. Um, my uh, colleague, the chief data officer of the Cook County Assessor's Office, Samantha Simpson, who's sitting next to me, uh, is uh, went to Washington, D.C. with our current Cook County Assessor, Fritz Kagey, to go talk to the federal government about opening up the appraisal data that is in Fannie and Freddie's uh, you know, databases, their big 
uh, I don't know, sack of information. Um, and so essentially, in order to be able to assess 1.1 million properties equitably, you need as much data as possible. We can't just kind of self-select from different sources, right? So we essentially went and knocked under the door of the White House and said, could we have that data, please? And they said, this is a very interesting problem to solve. Thank you for talking to us about it. Let's work on that together. Um, our assessor, Fritz Kagi, is kind of heading up this large jurisdiction task force of a sorts. As Dan pointed out, this is a national problem. It's not just a Chicago problem. It's not just a Cook County problem. Opening up this appraisal data will be used by many of the large jurisdiction assessments and would actually help to solve a problem of regressivity across the country. And to the White House's credit, they are very interested in helping us and other larger jurisdiction assessors solve this problem. So uh, I think Dan was uh, not wanting to necessarily talk too much about stuff that's still in process, but I feel very comfortable telling you that that is something that we are literally going to the White House to solve. Um, so hopefully you'll see more information on that very soon. Very cool. Thank you for that that extra information. All right. So I am sure that we have like a million more questions, but we have not a million more minutes. So we're going to call it here. Um, let's give another round of applause for... <laughs> <laughs>